Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number 10. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Homestead Journey podcast. Again, so thankful that you are willing to take time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This episode is going to be a special episode, and it is going to be a look back on 2019 here on 3B Farm and Homestead. What went right? What went wrong? kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Actually, not really, honestly, we had a very, very good year on 3B Farm and Homestead. All joking aside, uh, very, very blessed. And even the things that didn't go right really weren't all that bad. So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit, but just got done enjoying a wonderful homestead meal that was, well, the vast majority of it was either raised, produced, processed here on 3B Farm and Homestead uh, in some fashion or form or another. And that is that we had chicken noodle soup. Now on Christmas Day, and I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas, by the way, uh, Merry Christmas to those of you that celebrate it. And uh, on Christmas, we had uh, one of our smoked chickens. And so I brought the carcass home afterwards and today we threw it in the crock pot and cooked it down. And then uh, when I got home from work, I fished out the bones, opened up another can of uh, canned chicken that we canned this fall and uh, put that in there, uh, threw in a couple of uh, pints of the broth that we canned up this fall and then chopped up some carrots that we had frozen. Now we didn't grow those carrots, but we did buy them from a farm. We canned some, we froze some. So I chopped up some of those carrots, put them in there. Really the only thing that wasn't somehow processed on our farm or grown here on our farm was the spaghetti noodles that I put in there. But my goodness, folks, you talk about a rich, delicious, uh, I, I mean, it, it, it just blows Campbell's uh, chicken noodle soup right out of the water. I'm not going to lie. It was awesome and very, very satisfying. Um, to me, that's one of, as, as I've shared with you before, to me, there's just something so satisfying about sitting down to a meal. Uh, and when you look at that plate and, or in this case, the bowl, so much of the food that was on there, we had a hand in somehow producing and, uh, it's just very, very satisfying and it tastes great to boot. So, just got done with that, and so now we are ready to uh, jump in here and talk about uh, 2019, and then we're also going to take a look back uh, at this decade. We are coming to the end of the 2010s. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. Uh, time just marches on and waits for no man or woman, and uh, here we are getting ready to close out a decade and looking forward to the 2020s, and so... On this episode, we're going to kind of take a look back at 2019 and then really take a look at the 2010. So let's jump right into it. Again, this is a very special episode, so we are only going to have this segment on this episode, not going to do uh, the uh, Homestead Happenings, not going to be doing the Charting the Course or the um, uh, Homestead Hacks this time around. It's just going to be kind of this look back and lessons learned. So in 2019, I started out, if you visit our YouTube channel, uh, and the link to that is in the show notes, in 2019, uh, in March, I put out a video with kind of some major goals that we had for the Homestead uh, this year. And in that video, I actually went back and watched it uh, again uh, this week. And in that video, I had four major goals for this year. And then one, we'll call it a minor goal. It wasn't that big of a deal, but we'll call it a minor goal. So the four major goals that we had, first of all, was to build a, a Carolina carport for our tractors and, and other implements. Second major goal was to build a mobile chicken tractor. 
so that we can move our laying hens around our property. The third major goal was to add more raised beds to our garden area. And our fourth major goal was to build a greenhouse. And then what I'm calling a minor goal was to use cattle panels, which I have used as trellises before in my garden, but I've always used them kind of horizontally. Uh, what I wanted to try doing was kind of the hooped approach that I've seen on a many, many different uh, YouTube channels and in, in different gardens where you can kind of grow your crops over your head and it's supposed to make for easier picking of whatever crop it is, whether it's beans, cucumbers, you can even grow squash and watermelon that way if you support the uh, fruit. And uh, so those were my major goals for 2019. So how did we do? Well, if we were baseball players, we would be in the Hall of Fame because we got 50% of those goals achieved. So batting 500, that would definitely put us in the Hall of Fame, and uh, but we're not playing baseball. So uh, we got the Carolina carport put up. I had to have some fill brought in, had to have the spot leveled out, and then the Carolina carport was put up, and I'm very, very happy with that. In the future, the plan is to enclose it and kind of turn it into a bit of a barn, but right now it is uh, working out very well as a place to park our tractors and other implements out of the weather. The uh, second goal was the mobile chicken tractor, and I did not get that built. Uh, at the time that I was going to build it, we were in the, well, we had a bathroom remodel that kind of got sprung on us uh, in March and April, and that's when I was planning on focusing on working on that mobile chicken tractor. And so because of the bathroom remodel, which took us way longer and cost us more money, and quite frankly, to be honest with you, it's not 100% done. I'm usually an 85 to 90 percenter, and uh, I've got to get back to it and get the, the ceiling finished up. But uh, I just didn't have time in the spring to build that uh, mobile chicken tractor because by the time we got done with the, uh, the bathroom remodel, it was time to jump into starting seeds and getting the garden going and Cubs or Boy Scouts was was taking off and there's just a lot of stuff going on. So didn't get get that. I've got that on the list um, for this winter, but we'll talk about that on another day. Same thing with the uh, greenhouse. Uh, the time that I had allotted to uh, work on that greenhouse, it just wasn't feasible. It was a matter of do I build a greenhouse or do I enlarge my garden area? And so I opted this year to go ahead and put in the raised beds. So uh, we put in the raised beds. That was not a 100% success, and I'll tell you about that here in a second. But between building the greenhouse or putting in raised beds, I opted for the raised beds. And so we added four additional 4x12 four raised beds. Um, the, the, again, that didn't go 100% according to plan. I decided to put some wood chips in the bottom of those beds, thinking maybe of a mo a modified, and, and I never can say this right, but is it Hugo culture bed? Uh, you know, kind of that Swedish approach where you put in wood, you bury it, and then as that rots down, it provides nutrients to the soil and it heats the soil. Uh, and so that was my thought process was, hey, I've got all these wood chips. I can put those in there, put the soil on top of it. As those wood chips rot down, they're going to provide heat and nutrients to my plants. And that's going to be awesome. Except that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, in fact, what happened is I caused some nitrogen deficiency in my raised beds. And so um, I did get production out of them finally towards the end of the summer. Uh, they started, I, I think the decomposition of the wood chips kind of was done and then they started kind of bouncing back. But I certainly didn't get the production out of those beds that I had anticipated um, because of kind of that mistake. So learned a lesson the hard way that I want to impress on you so you don't do the same, mis make the same mistake that I did. Um, don't put wood chips in the bottom of your raised beds. It doesn't work very well. But uh, so raised beds, um, was very happy with that. The cattle panel hoops, 
I only put up one, uh, and I and, and and that one was very successful. I actually ran uh, runner beans over that, um, and was very happy with uh, with that. So I'll be doing more of that this coming year. But because it seemed like the squash and so forth really wasn't going to do much, I opted not to put the cattle panel hoops up um, because I I didn't feel like it was going to make make any sense to do so. Hindsight being what it is, I probably should have gone ahead and done that because some of the squash did, in fact, um, run and uh, and created some other problems and was kind of running out of the bed and into the into the aisles and so forth, into the rows. So uh, next year, definitely, I will be doing the cattle panel hoops um, as, as a way of kind of doing some vertical gardening, so to speak. But uh, overall, I mean... Basically, it was a 50, uh, you know, I, I batted 500 this year. And so I'm, I'm very happy with that. And the, the two that I didn't get to, the mobile chicken tractor and the greenhouse, there were extenuating circumstances uh, that kind of kept me from being able to do those. And so I've got them on the list potentially for this year as we think about goals for 2020. Uh, we'll find out uh, whether or not they make the cut. But uh, that is certainly um, a potential. A possibility, shall we say, that we will be putting in a greenhouse and a, building a mobile chicken tractor this year. But beyond those major goals, we had some other things that we attempted this year uh, here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Some things went very well, some things not so well. So the first big thing that we tried this year was we tried making some soap using the lard from our, our American guinea hogs. And uh, overall, that went well. Um, I made two different batches. I made one that was a straight lard soap, one that was a lard and coconut oil. And people seem to like the coconut oil uh, soap better. Um, I didn't follow up on my test cases, you know, my, my, my test subjects, the people that I gave the soap to. I didn't follow up with them as, as well as I should have, but um, a, a couple of them did give me feedback. And that was kind of the takeaway that uh, that they had was that the uh, lard soap with the coconut oil um, lathered better, performed better. So I'm going to be doing some more of that probably this winter. Um, but I, I didn't do as much of it as I'd hoped to do, to be honest. I wanted to do a little bit more soaping this year and uh, certainly didn't uh, get as much done as I wanted. Uh, next big thing that we did this year is we uh, tried turkeys for the first time on our homestead. And uh, overall, it was uh, successful. We started out, I think, with six turkeys. Only three of them survived to uh, maturity, which, again, batting 500. So I guess in baseball terms, so very successful Hall of Fame statistics. <laughs> but I learned some things along the way, even with the, the losses. Um, one of them I lost to Predators. Uh, and a couple other ones just seemed to have uh, heart attacks. They were they seemed okay one day, and then boom, they were dead the next. So not totally sure what took place there. But uh, overall, I was very happy with uh, raising the turkeys. And now I think we're going to continue to raise turkeys. It's just a matter of determining what breed we're going to settle on. I, I did the broad-breasted whites the first time around just because they're cheaper. And I figured if I was going to screw it up, it wasn't going to cost me a whole lot of money. And uh, so that's what we did. This year, we also added geese. Again, mixed reviews on that. The plan was to have them come in to be guard geese for our flock. But there were some issues with them shipping to the farm where we were going to pick them up at. So we got them late, uh, much later than I had hoped. And by the time we got them, we were putting our meat birds out on, uh, out on pasture. And so... Um, I wasn't able to do the guard goose raised with the meat birds to imprint that this is your family and put them out. So these geese that I have now have all been raised together and we've enjoyed them. They're a lot of fun, but I'm not sure now whether or not I'm going to be able to separate them and use them as guard animals for other, you know, for the chickens and, and, and so forth. So uh, if you have any kind of knowledge on that, I'd love to hear from you whether or not you've ever done anything like that. Um, send me an email, the homestead journey podcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook and send me a message. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback on that. This year, we also got ducks 
again. Now, this wasn't our first time getting ducks. We had ducks for the first time back in, I'm thinking it was 2015, 2014, somewhere in that in that time frame. Um, my son got them through the fair. He got them for free. And that was a big fiasco. Um, and they ended up just thinking really bad. And it was a management issue because I, it was the first time I'd ever done ducks. And so I was keeping them in a in a run that was elevated, thinking I was doing the right thing. And the feed and the water and the feces were dropping down under, underneath there. And it was just making this toxic mess. It just reeked. And I couldn't I couldn't rake it all out. And it just really stunk really bad. And so eventually I just had enough of it and I got rid of the ducks. But this year, after doing some more reading, some more research into ducks, I decided I wanted to try it again. And it has been much more successful this year. And I think in part it's because of our management style. Um, and so not 100% sure what I'm going to do with them. I, I didn't really have any great grand plan for the ducks we don't really care for their eggs. They're great for baking, but for eating, we don't really care for them. My wife and son like smoked duck, but not regular duck. Um, and in these ducks that I have now, I've kind of let get too big um, because of the pin feather things. Ducks are a bit of a pain to to um, to pluck. I did get some more, or my son got some more this year through the fair, which we raised out, and then we took and had them processed and had some of them smoked and loved that. So that was a big success. This year we also changed uh, our approach to meat birds. So we've not been doing meat birds very long, only for a couple of years. But I was doing uh, 25 in the spring and then 25 in the fall. Um, this year I just did them in the spring. And uh, I think that's going to be the way I do it from now on. And the reason being is that in the fall, because of how our fair our, our local fair falls, our county fair falls. I, I have to be getting the meat, the 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 chicks, uh, around that same time frame in order to get them processed before it gets too cold. And we're so busy and involved with the fair that it really just, it, it's just one more thing that we really don't need. And then the weather is so unreliable in the fall. I just, I think doing it in the spring is going to work out better for us. And so I think going forward, we're just going to do meat birds in the spring once a year and be done with it. Another major thing that we did this year, I shouldn't say major thing, but it was a new thing for us. And that is that we put a roadside vegetable stand out. Now we've been selling eggs out by the roadside, uh, man, for, I don't know, four or five years. I think, uh, well, maybe not that long. Well, about four seasons, I guess. I guess we started doing it in 2016. And this year we put the vegetable uh, vegetable stand out there. Uh, and it, it wasn't as, as successful as I had hoped. Uh, we had some issues with um, the zucchini and the summer squash, which I had hoped to sell a lot of that. And I struggled to grow any of that. I had some issues growing cucumbers, and I thought those would do well out there. Um, the tomatoes didn't sell as well as I had hoped. The lettuce didn't sell at all. So uh, got some tweaking to do with that. Um, but we did sell some vegetables. And uh, so overall that was, um, I wouldn't call it a success. I wouldn't call it an utter failure. But uh, still got some tweaking more to do on that. We did have somebody, again, been doing this since 2016. So 2016, 17, 18, 19. So fourth season. And for the first time we had somebody uh, break into our egg box this year. Um, so that was a new experience for us. Uh, I, I don't think we've ever had, it's an honor system. I don't think we've ever had a, a dozen eggs. Maybe once we had a dozen eggs go missing. But sometimes what would happen is people would, would say, uh, they'd leave me a note and they'd be like, all I had was a five. So next time I'll put a dollar in and I'll just take a dozen eggs because I sell them for three bucks a dozen. You know, or sometimes I'd have people leave me a note and say, uh, I only had two bucks, I'll give you a dollar the next time. And almost inevitably, eventually an extra dollar would show up. Um, sometimes I might have somebody throw in some change and it would come up to like 80, you know, 285 or something like that. But uh, never, never did I have any blatant theft and I never had anybody break in and try to steal um, the money itself until this year.
and then somebody broke in, uh, ripped the front of it, it off. They actually ended up throwing it up the driveway. I didn't find it for a couple of days. I had replaced um, the front of the cash box by the time I found uh, the door that they had ripped off. Um, they stole all the eggs that were in there, and one, we keep ice packs in there. They, they stole one of the ice packs. Why not take both of them? I don't know. It was insane. So I just posted on our local town garage sale slash complaint department site <laughs> that they have on Facebook. And I, and I said to people, you know, I just simply said, this is the first time we've ever had this happen. If you know who did it, let them know if they're that desperate for cash or food to come see us and we will hook them up. And the responses I got from people, it was mind blowing. People that were so encouraging. Um, and, uh, I had actually had, I was out fixing the egg box the next day and I had a, uh, a couple stop by and um, they handed me a $20 bill and they said, we feel so badly about this, uh, that this happened in our community and we just want to, we want to give you 20 bucks. And, and, and it was not for me, it was for my son, the, the, the sales of the eggs and the, and the, and the vegetables this summer uh, were going to my son to help fund his scouting activities. But uh, that kind of response just absolutely blew me away. It was amazing. And uh, so anyhow, we had that happen this year. Um, this year, we also did a lot more canning. Um, we canned beef for the first time, carrots for the first time, peach jam for the first time, uh, as well as the normal stuff that we usually do. And we also changed up the way that we approach how we can chicken. So the last couple of years we've been canning chicken. I've been cooking it down, deboning it, and then canning the chicken like that. But this year, what is what I did instead, uh, because of some things I had seen on some YouTube videos, in, in particular from the Pratt family homestead, uh, I raw packed it. And you talk about taking uh, a chore and cutting it by two thirds. I mean, it was way because again, you're, before my approach was to boil it down. Then you got to let it cool down and pick the meat off the bones. And then you got to pack it into the jars. You know, where I was just taking the raw chicken, bam, into the jars, bam, into the canner, bam, I was done. Not only that, but I had my big, huge canner uh, that uh, I purchased uh, at the flea market, which holds like 19 quarts. So it was bam, bam, and we were done. And then I think, I'm trying to remember if I had the 921 at that point. I don't think I did have the 921 when we did the chicken. But if I, if I would have the 921, it also holds, does it hold 19 quarts? I can't remember how many quarts it holds. But if I would have had the two of them, man, it would have really gone fast. Um, but we did that this year, so that was really exciting. But we did more canning this year than we have in a long time. And uh, so very, very satisfying. Finally, the last major thing that I did this year was I, I took my first crack at doing lacto-fermented um, peppers and uh, and then turning them into sauce. And again, wasn't 100% a success, but it was pretty successful. And overall, I'm happy with the product and uh, more to learn and more to tweak. And that's, you know, you got to start somewhere. But uh, overall, was very, very happy with it. So all in all, this year, really, on 3B Farm and Homestead, it was uh, overall a good year. Um, we had some flubs. You know, I had uh, another accidental <laughs> breeding of one of my pigs. And unfortunately, as I shared in last uh, week's episode, she gave birth on the coldest day so far, I think, this year in, in this winter, um, the 2019 to 2020 winter where it was like six degrees below zero. And so I lost that entire litter of piglets. Uh, and so that was very disappointing. And, and along the way, you know, we, we've lost some animals to uh, predation. We lost some animals to just various ailments, some chickens that just, you know, keeled over, turkeys that just keeled over. We have no, no idea why. Um, but those things happen. You know, when you have livestock, as my buddy Dave says, eventually you're going to have dead stock. It just is what it is. And, and sometimes it's not that you did anything wrong. It just it just happens. Life happens. And uh, so you kind of just got to go on with it. But again, overall this year, very successful year. Very happy um, with how things have gone 
on 3B Farm and Homestead. On the next episode, I'm going to share with you some of our plans, or at least some of my ideas and plans for this coming year. And then next year, we'll be able to look back at that and see how well I did, how well we did here on the... Uh, and folks, I come up with these ideas, these plans, and I think everybody should do that. Really, I do. If, you've, if you're homesteading, you really need to come up with a plan for the year because... Homesteading costs money. You need to figure out how you're going to fit it into your budget. You need to figure out, you know, time-wise, what can you handle time-wise. Um, and so you need to approach this kind of very methodically and not just, and I understand different people approach things differently. Don't get me wrong. But if you try to do all the things all at once, you're going to overwhelm yourself. You're going to burn yourself out and you're going to quit. So, you know, my, my, I strongly urge you to think about 2020 think about what your budget is your time um you know you know your land situation you know what you're interested in and then pick out you know three or four big things like we did last year that you want to tackle and uh then if you're if you you're successful great and if you're not don't let it get you down it's all good um but again to have that plan i think is is good so let's now jump over to 2010, the 2010s in review, we'll call it. So when we, if you go back and you listen to episode number one, um, you will understand, if you haven't already listened to episode number one, go back and listen to it. I think that'll give you good context. You'll understand that we did not come into homesteading with any plan of homesteading. Um, we were doing homesteading things, but it wasn't until 2017 that I really had a name to attach to what it was that we were doing. Up to that point, to me, it was just living. It's what my my grandparents had always done. It's what my parents had done off and on. Uh, it's what my, my in-laws had done off and on. So uh, my aunts and uncles have done it. So to me, it was just a way of life. It was just living. They didn't really have a name for it. But we bought this property in 2008. And uh, shortly thereafter, we put in the raised beds, uh, a few raised beds. It was, I think, two four by fours and maybe two eight by fours, but not a whole lot of raised beds. Uh, and that was pretty much the extent of what we did on this property that would be considered, quote unquote, homesteading related. Now, at my grandfather's house, which is about a quarter of a mile away, we had a very, very large garden spot. And so I was gardening there very heavily. And we were canning a lot of stuff. We were freezing a lot of stuff. Um, we were, you know, we, we were growing squash and putting that in cold storage. So we were doing a lot of, we were raising chickens at my grandfather's. We were doing a lot of the homesteading things, but a lot of it wasn't here on this property. So in 2010, uh, the first big thing that we did that was kind of homesteading related is we bought a tractor and that was a 1953 Farmall Cub. And I bought it for two reasons. I bought it because, first of all, we have a very long driveway, and so I bought it to plow the driveway in the winter. But then I also bought it because I had a single bottom plow, and that way I could plow the, the garden at my grandfather's. And uh, so we bought that in, in 2010. From 2010 until 2013, not a lot changed. We were doing the chickens at my grandfather's, we were doing the garden at my grandfather's, we were doing a little garden up here, and that was pretty much the extent of it. In 2013, things started to change. My grandfather had uh, gotten sick and had moved up to my aunt's house. And so we moved the chicken operation up to our house. We built our permanent chicken uh, coop and, um, and moved that chicken operation up to here. We also experimented with a, a few different ways of raising chickens. Uh, we had always ordered the chicks through the mail and we had ordered... Generally speaking, we had ordered um, the barnyard mix or whatever it was, a, just a mix of different things from the, the hatcheries. And then we would raise them in the spring through the fall. And then in the fall, whatever cockerels came, we would dress those off with the hens for meat in the fall, put them in the freezer. And in the spring, we would repeat the cycle. So we started changing things up a little bit. One year, I can't remember, it was 2012, it might have been, we went breed specific and all we had were buff Orpingtons. And so then the next year, what I did is I had the rooster, some hens, and I let some hens set. 
And uh, that year we didn't order any chicks at all. We just had the chicks that we had hatched out that year. The following year, I ordered a bunch of cockerels as meat birds um, and raised them for some friends. That was the first time I ever kept track of how much it actually cost me to raise chickens. And boy, was that an eye opener. Um, Because I told my friends that I was going to do it for them at cost. And then I I was so embarrassed when I had the final bill um, because I I had no idea. We had always, when we needed chicken feed, just we went down and bought chicken feed. I mean, we never really thought anything about it. Again, it was just a way of life for us. And uh, so that was really a an eye-opening experience for us. I also built some hoop coops that we were trying to pull around the yard. Um, and uh, I way overbuilt them. Instead of doing two by fours on the bottom, I did two by sixes thinking I was doing myself a favor. And those things are heavier than a dead preacher. And my wife, she, I was doing a lot of traveling at work for work and she was struggling to move them. And uh, those standard breed roosters just killed my my yard. I don't think it's ever really fully recovered from that. Anyhow, in 2015, we got rabbits, uh, and that was not by design. My dad dropped off uh, three rabbits that we were supposed to watch for 10 days. He didn't come back and get them for 10 months. And in that time, (laughs) we learned a lot about bunny math. Uh, At one point, I can't remember, we had, I, I don't even remember, it was 40, 50 bunny, it was crazy. Um, we learned a lot about bunny math that year. In 2015, I also built a whiz bang chicken plucker. And that was the first year I had been taking my chickens to have them processed, um, by, uh, a, a local processor, but their pricing had kept going up and up. And so I decided this is getting too expensive. I can build a whiz bang chicken plucker for less than what it's costing me to process these birds. And then I'll process them on my own. So I did that in 2015. Uh, In 2016, I experimented with fodder for rabbits and for chickens, um, growing fodder and uh, sprouting. I think it was using barley. And uh, so I built a fodder system and uh, I never really got that dialed in. I always had problems with mold, never felt comfortable feeding it to my rabbits. I would feed it to my chickens, but they would only eat the roots. They never ate the green stuff. And the reason why I was doing it is because in the winter I wanted them to have some green stuff to eat because if they eat the green stuff, it really affects the color of the yolks. The yolks will be a little bit more orange almost. And so when I saw they were just eating the seed mat, I said, well, what in the world's the point of this? Um, And so I shut down the fodder system. Uh, In 2016, we also started selling eggs by the side of the road. Up to that point, we had always just taken the eggs to church and get we, we were giving them away. But when we started going to our new church, there were a lot of people at our church who are involved in agriculture and sell eggs and so forth. And that's part of the way that they make a living. And so I didn't feel like it was right for me to just bring eggs up to church and just give them away. Like, well, here, I have eggs for everybody. Um, and and then I didn't feel like that was fair to the farmers that were selling them as, as for a living. And so we started selling the eggs by the side of the road. And that really has helped offset some of our costs, certainly not breaking even on it, but uh, it does help offset some of our costs for what we do. In 2016, I also um, discovered the world of fermentation. Uh, I had been having some problems with gastrointestinal issues and they had prescribed the probiotic pill. And I said, no way, I'm taking a pill. Where can I find probiotics naturally? And that's when I found about, out about sauerkraut and kombucha and, and all of those things. And uh, so I started making kraut. Um, I, I did kombucha for a while, didn't care for it a whole lot, so quit making it. But I, I, I'd like to get back to doing that. But uh, I've made kraut, I think, every year since. I've experimented with some other fermentation things. Um, this year I did the lacto-fermented peppers. Um, so that was 2016. 2017 is really when I discovered homesteading. And the reason why I discovered homesteading, or the term homesteading, is because that's the year that we got the American guinea hogs. And so when I bought the American guinea hogs, I started looking on YouTube for how to raise American guinea hogs. And I ran across um, Alderman Farms. I ran across... Uh, Cog Hill Farm. They had American guinea hogs at the time. And that just really um, grass-fed homestead out in Idaho. That really opened up my eyes to the online homesteading community and 
for the first time in my life, I had a name for what it is that we were doing here on our property. So that was 2017. Uh, in 2017, I also, um, it was my first attempt at apple scrap vinegar, um, which again is another fermentation process. Um, 2017 was the first time I canned chicken and found out that we liked it and that was a viable way for us to uh, deal with our hens instead of just putting them in the freezer because when I would put them in the freezer, my wife would rarely cook them because she said they were tough. And uh, so we did that in 2017 and found out that we really, really liked it. Uh, 2018 is when we put in our grow light system and started our first transplants to put into the garden. We also, I, th I think it was 2018, it might have been 2017 was our first meat chickens. It might have been 2017. Um, yeah, I think it was. Uh, in 2018, I also experimented with a straw bale gardening, and that was a <laughs> big flop. Me, me, me. Wah, wah, wah. Uh, didn't work well. It, it worked well for some people, didn't work for us. 2018, I put in more raised beds, so we put in four more. Uh, four by 12 raised beds. So I think over, we more than doubled the raised beds that we had here. The first pigs were born on our farm, on our homestead in 2018. And uh, I learned how to castrate piglets for the first time. We also took American guinea hogs to our county fair for the first time in 2018. And uh, that was a lot of fun. We've shown chickens and I've put uh, vegetables and, and canned goods in the the fair now for over 10 years we've shown my son shown rabbits um we've done that now for over 10 years i think uh but um 2018 was the first time that we did american guinea hogs at the fair and it was an absolute blast did it again this year absolute blast um so that that that's just been a lot of fun 2018 we upgraded our tractor to a coyote 30 uh, ck 3510 se which is a a 35 horsepower uh, coyote tractor with a bucket and a rear mounted snow blower to be able to deal with the uh, the snow because when I put in my raised beds I lost the area where I could push the snow off my driveway with the um, with the uh, Farmall Cub. Um, the Farmall Cub I think it's only nine horsepower maybe 15 but I think it's nine horsepower and so I really had to push those banks back a long way in the winter time and so when I put in the new raised beds, I lost the area where I would push the snow. So I got the uh, snow blower on the back of the coyote and boy, that's been awesome. And then the bucket's just been amazing. 2018, we processed our first pig ever on uh, the homestead. My dad and I processed one and we had the ribs smoked for uh, Christmas and we took the shoulders down to my, my father-in-law and he boned them out and we had those for New Year's last year. And then also took one of the uh, hind legs and it's hanging, curing in the basement right now for pr prosciutto. Uh, I wanted to do that again this year, but I just kind of ran out of time. But um, hopefully we will get some, uh, some more prosciutto hanging in the basement. And then 2018 was also the first time I ever rendered lard from our American guinea hog. So that was a new thing to us. And now I've done that several times since then, but that was a new skill for us to learn. So, man, it's just amazing to me when I look back over 2019, as we did at the first part of this episode, and then I look back over the over 20 the 2010s, shall we say. Uh, it, it reminds me of, was it the Virginia Slim commercial, You've Come a Long Way, Baby? But it's just amazing to me how much uh, our well, our, our farm, our homestead has grown in in the last year, but in the last 10 years and uh, how much we've grown and, how, you know, the skills that we've acquired um, in the last 10 years. It's just when you stop and you kind of pause and you reflect back, um, it's, it's amazing and uh, it's very satisfying. And who knows what the next 10 years have, but... Uh, Man, I'm enjoying this, and uh, I hope that um, this will encourage you. You know, your your journey is going to be different than ours, 
And uh, there may be things on this list that I've shared that are things that you are interested in trying, and there may be things on this list that you have no interest in trying. And there may be other things that I didn't mention that you are excited to try, and it's all good. Uh, everybody's homestead journey is going to be different, and that's okay, and that, that's the way it should be. The things that interest you, the things that you can do on your property, on your land, or maybe you don't have property at all, but you're just trying to do it through... Uh, bartering with people and using, you know, community resources, your journey is going to be different than mine. And, and the things that you find interesting in are going to be different than things that I find interesting. And, and it's all good. Um, and we can encourage one another. This isn't a competition. The things that uh, you find important are important to you. And that's awesome. And my goal with this podcast is to encourage you to keep on the journey to keep journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, however that takes shape in your life. And I'm going to keep doing the same thing here. I'm going to keep journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. We haven't arrived, folks. There's a ton of stuff that we can do better. There's a ton of stuff that we can do differently. And it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, a lot of you, when I look back over this list here, from you know 10 years of, of homesteading although for the first I guess seven of it I didn't really realize what I was doing that it was homesteading um, but when I look back over this it's just absolutely mind-blowing to me and uh, and it's exciting to me um, and again it's something that's very very satisfying so I've I hope you found this episode uh, interesting and uh, I'm looking forward to next week's episode when we talk about some of our plans for 2020 and some of the things that I'm thinking about doing. And then it's going to be really cool at the end of 2020 when we take a look back and we say, okay, how, how well did we do on the first year of the 2020s? All right, everybody. Thanks so much again for joining us on the Homestead Journey podcast. My name is Brian. This is 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Have a blessed day and have an awesome new year. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.